All right, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for being here. My name is Hunter Hutton. I am a master's student at Virginia Tech, working on my project to develop FRP retrofit guidelines for deficient horizontal lateral force resisting systems. FRP stands for fiber reinforced polymer, just by the way, get that out of the way. Um, I'm co-advised by Dr. Eric Jacques, who's in the audience, and Dr. Matt Etherton. Um, this is an ACI CRC co-funded project with a lot of industry, industry sponsors that you see on the screen. Just some background here. So what, why, why are we doing this research? So the horizontal lateral force resisting systems and reinforced concrete buildings is made up of diaphragms, cords, and collectors. A lot of times they require strengthening for maybe a, numerous reasons. Maybe you just need to increase size and performance because of code change. Maybe there's a missing load path. Maybe there's a new load path. Maybe you've got penetrations cut in the slab. Like I said, there could be numerous reasons you need to strengthen your diaphragm. But the problem is there's a lack of consensus on how to just do that. Um, there's really no design guidelines or limit states detailing guides for this, and there's really no uniformity in the industry practice. It seems that each industry professional does something slightly different, and there's really no substantial test data to date. So the overview of my project, what we're trying to do is, like I said, develop those design retrofit guidelines to safely and economically achieve your performance objectives. So you want to improve, obviously, your shear capacity, and you want to refine your models. That way you know you're doing this right. Um, how, is, how is FRP actually benefiting you? That's what we want to know. What's the behavior like? Um, what's the effect of varying your FRP arrangement? What I mean by that, using different widths of strips, using different thicknesses of fabric, anchoring your fabrics differently. End anchorage, intermediate anchors, how are you anchoring this thing, plays a big role into what you get out of the performance. What is an effective design strain? This is a big one. This is the big thing in this presentation. If you get nothing out of me blabbing, this one is what you need to remember. Um, what is that design strain you're going off of? Is it 004, is it 0015? Let's talk about it in a little bit. Um, and then a key topic also is a lot of times uh, industry professionals are treating a diaphragm as a one-sided shear wall retrofit. Is that accurate? Well, maybe. We're going to try to find out. Um, so this experimental program that I'm running, it can, it's comprised of six cantilever diaphragm specimens. You see right here a schematic of a 3D view of my project. Um, basically, the setup incorporates two specimens into one, uh, one iteration here. They are tested separately. Um, they're about half scale, they're 10 by 8 in plan dimension, they're 4 inches thick, um, 4,000 KSI or 4,000 PSI uh, nominal concrete strength, and we're using a low density fabric, 10 or 20 ounce carbon fabric. We're using carbon because that's what you most typically see in industry. Um, and you might say, okay, why are you using low density fabric? They're using 40 ounce stuff in the field. Well, that comes back to our test setup details here. So we're limited to 330 kips of capacity. Now, if you apply 40 ounce fabric to my specimen, we don't have the, we don't have a way to break it. So that, that's a key parameter there. Uh, our instrumentation here can go plus or 15 minus in inches in stroke. Um, we're running a cyclic displacement protocol that's based on four, FEMA 461. And like I said, each side of this, so we cast this whole thing at one time. However, they are independent from each other and they're tested separately. We'll break one, we'll unhook the actuator, the loading block, the loading channels, crane it to the other side, hook it up, test the other one, maybe a, it's about a week turnaround. And this blue central span truss in the middle cuts down on our cost as it's reusable for every setup that we do. So that's the setup. Let's talk about my first two specimens that I've tested. Um, so like I said, there's six total, two are dead, we've got four to go. Um, CD1 is the control, so no FRP, but you're going to say, oh, well, there's FRP on this drawing, right? There is, but it's not for what you think. Uh, there was some poor concrete consolidation on this pour, and we did not want a direct shear failure on this loading beam. So that was just an emergency repair plan. It has nothing to do with the research. We're not going to talk about it a ton. I just wanted to point it out. It is there, but it's not for what you think. Um, some nominal capacities there, so you've got VC and VS, that's your shear capacity of your concrete and steel. That sums up to about 150, and then you run over to CD2. So what do you got here? You got the same exact concrete and steel configuration, but now we're running 12-inch CFRP strips, 20, 24 inches on center, and we've got an end anchorage detail here at the top right, you can see. And those are on each end of the fabric, about five and a half inches from the edge of the slab. Um, 
So if you take all that into consideration, use uh, the equation provided in 440, which I'll get to in a little bit, and we're assuming an effective design strain here, this is important, a 004, you get a increase in shear strength of 72. So if you compare nominal capacities, 217 versus 146. Now, we know these nominal capacities are gonna be lower than what's expected, primarily because the shear equation for steel strength neglects your perpendicular steel in the direction of your shear force. Um, so these are the first two that we've gotten, and I'm gonna talk about some data here in a second. Um, but first, I just wanna show you some quick time-lapse videos of what you actually see when you test these guys. So this is CD1, cantilever diaphragm one, no retrofit, here we go. Um, you're gonna think I didn't press the play button, but this, the, it's slow in the beginning, the displacements are slow, it's so small you can't tell. But there we go, there's our first crack. And what you'll see is we'll get some small flexural cracks. And then after that, you're gonna have predominant diagonal tension crack in both directions. We're pushing and pulling this thing. Uh, we're getting bigger cracks in the push direction. So there's the first appearance of our big guy right there. And then if I correct, I believe that's our crack of death. It'll get pretty big here in a second. Um, let's see, pretty much about to open up. And you can also notice these cracks are almost spaced about 12, I mean, if you squint, they're about 12 inches apart and that's pretty much the bar spacing. And there you go, there's the big opening in that crack. And that's, the, that's what we called failure here on CD1. So next is time-lapse CD2. This one's a little more interesting because you got FRP on this guy. You're gonna see the predominant failure that we get on here. If you're familiar with FRP, you know what it's gonna be. If you don't, and this is new, um, typically you get a debonding failure. So you get a, the laminate does not stay on the concrete basically. And that can happen in two ways. The epoxy can fail between the concrete and the laminate, or you can, your epoxy can be so strong, your force so high that you can yank your top cover off. And that's what we experience predominantly here. Um, we have, since this is a four inch slab, we have half inch cover, half inch cover just peeled right up at, at a, uh, about 004 strain. Um, you'll see that pretty soon. It's a pretty explosive failure. Um, you can see that strip right there starting to, and there you go, boom, blew off. That anchor, anchor ruptured, and this one's still holding. Um, two over, still holding, so you're getting some contribution from that. So I'll show you here a preliminary data comparison. This is just preliminary, these results are really, really new, uh, so this might be subject to change. But on the left, you see a shear angle versus load comparison, and when I say shear angle, I'll refer to this image right here just to kind of show you what I mean by shear angle. That is uh, kind of the shear deformation of that diaphragm in respect to the shear wall. And so that's what's on the x-axis. You got load on the y, and as you can see, CD2 reached a capacity of about 280 kips. CD1 got about to 203, and you can see in comparison what the nominal values of those dotted lines are. Um, so as I said, we designed this for 004 strain. However, that at 004, you know, this thing's blowing up. Peeling, the strips are peeling off, you're yielding steel. So maybe we don't want to do that. You probably want to, what we think is good is 0015, and that's what I have dotted here. A shear angle of about 0032 corresponds with a design strain of 0015. And I'll talk a little bit more about our strains here. So this shows what CD2 looks like at the time capture of a uh, design strain of 0015. So you can see you've got some, those, are sh those sharpie lines are a lot bigger than what you actually see. Um, those cracks are small, they're in between the sheets, you're not, nothing's blowing up, so you're good there. And um, so we instrumented two of the sheets with three strain gauges each, so six total, five were functional. And out of those five, we see that we did get to 004 out of some of them, and those are the ones that debonded at failure. If you can see, those are on the south end of the slab, which is where those did debond. But like I said, this dotted line here represents 0015, and I think that's where we really want to be. That way we can limit steel yielding and we don't want to lose any aggregate interlock. So we're working on some finite modeling as well. So I'll, I want to give credit where credit's due. This is uh, modeling done by my colleague, Pratiksha. She's in the audience back there. She's a great finite element modeler. I don't want to take credit for this, um, but some details. 
is this is an abacus spotted element model. Um, it's fully integrated with two inch concrete elements and then the truss rebar elements. Um, this model, slightly different than, so we did cyclic displacement. This is monotonic for now. We're gonna change that in the future. Um, it's a damaged plasticity model for concrete and a bilinear hardened steel model. Um, so what are we getting out of this graph? So right now, we, I think we, we can say we pretty accurately match the initial stiffness of our specimen, which is pretty good. Um, as well as that, we've also almost matched that peak load. With a little tweaking, we'll probably get there. And the next steps, like I said, tune those concrete and steel models. Um, we want to add FRP, continue these models with the retrofits. We want to incorporate the cyclic loading and set a monotonic. And the whole goal of that is to understand the force flow better. So some conclusions, what do you get out of this? So obviously adding FRP externally bonded adds to your shear capacity as well as your stiffness of the reinforced concrete diaphragms. What we saw is that debonding governed ex govern your failure as expected. Now this is that equation I referenced earlier. It's equation 114A and ACI 442R. Um, we have shown that it has produced re reasonable results, about 77 kip uh, additional strength and the equation predicted 72, so that's pretty good. And we've got, you know, again, this equation's dependent on what strain you choose. So we chose 004 just to get, you know, what where's it going to break at? And this that was accurate for a 10 ounce fabric that's anchored on the ends. That may not tr be true for denser fabrics or di di uh, different anchor configurations. And again, I want to hammer this home. I think 0015 is a better strain to be using for design. So plan future work. Like I said, we got four more of these to do. So this is subject to change, the drawings at least, but these are the ideas we want to do. We want to use intermediate anchors to see what kind of delamination delay we get. We want to use a denser 20 ounce fabric to see what kind of different force flow we get. Those are going to be equivalent in area, so they'll be, um, or equivalent in volume. They'll be 20 ounce, so they're a heavier fabric, but they'll be a different, they'll be a smaller width. So we had 12 inches previously, right now we're looking at six inches. We'll see where that turns out. And then our last specimen, we wanna do a typical bi-directional retrofit with fabric running in the north, south, and east, west directions. So what do you wanna do with that? So ultimately, what are we trying to do is develop some retrofit design guidelines. And first we need to identify deficiencies in existing structures, and then streamline a computational FRP retrofit design process that says start here, this is how you specify this retrofit with carbon FRP. And with that, I'll say thank you for your time. I'll open it up to questions. I want to acknowledge our project team and advisory panel who spent many hours on this project.